today on Ask This Old House. Cutting and drilling masonry materials may be hazardous to your health, but new technology is out to solve that. Look at the end of the shank. Oh, no way. That air inlet is what sucks in the dust down the shank into the vacuum. This is my problem right here. Last few weeks, the toilet's been getting really wobbly, and I just put that in there for a short-term fix. This is not the way to shim a toilet. I'll show you how to do it properly. And we'll meet up with maker Jimmy DeResta for a very unique building. This is Tennessee birch, sliced about two inches thick, and then pieced together in a sort of a geometric pattern. Hi there. I'm Kevin O'Connor and welcome back to Ask This Old House. We have got a great show for you today. Richard takes on a wobbly toilet and I take Build It on the Road. We're actually going to be working with a very talented craftsman in upstate New York. And our mason Mark McCullough has got some safety concerns to talk about. Mark, good morning. Hey Kevin. Your tools as great. requested. Thank you. So new guidelines coming down the road. That's right. Every time we cut concrete, stone, brick, mortar, it creates crystalline silica dust, which is totally our enemy. So it is a very fine particulate, and if you breathe it in, all sorts of nasty things can come of it. We've heard of silicosis, lung cancer, not good stuff. Not good stuff. So over the years, what we've typically done is whoever was using a tool, again, a drill or a grinder, we'd have a guy right beside him with a vacuum cleaner, right. and he'd be just dragging that hose and sucking up all the dust. We've seen that uh, before. We've seen you guys using hoses. I mean, I, ideally a wet saw, but sometimes just putting water on it really keeps the dust down. That's right. Um, they've come up with some new technology and new equipment that we're going to be able to use. All right. Well, let's see how dusty the old-fashioned right. way is if we uh, just drill with a regular bit into this right. concrete. Let's see how that goes. Wow, so a lot of dust initially at least. So Kevin, as you can see, we just have an adapter that retrofits onto our vacuum. You can see this little pocket right here enables us to suction onto the wall. Mm -hmm. You can see this little area, that's where the dust is going to be collected. And you can stick pretty much any size bit through there. That's right. It's okay. actually a neat little tool. So Kevin, having a vacuum is very helpful, but if I'm on a staging and I don't have electricity, I'm in trouble. Mm -hmm. So look at this little adapter. Docks, yeah, docks right onto my hammer drill just like that. Cordless vac for the cordless drill. Exactly. So Kevin, up until this point, I've showed you just off the shelf bits. Look at this guy that I have here. See the hose? Yeah. That's our vacuum. Goes into this little adapter. So attached to the bit, but almost a foot away from the tip. But look at the end of the shank. Oh, no way. Yeah, that's right where we collect the dust. <laughs> that air inlet is what sucks in the dust down the shank into the vacuum. Let's see that one work. Yeah, let's give that a try. one of the messiest jobs that we do, cutting, grinding, or smoothing. And this is the tool we use. It's just a grinder. Very dusty without an adapter. But when we hook up the vacuum to the dust trap, there's almost no dust. And this is a grinder with a tuck pointing blade. We're going to show you without dust collection and with dust collection. Wow. Virtually dust-free grinding and drilling. That is impressive and a huge improvement. It's a big improvement, but great technology. Can I try? Sure. Want to tackle all your home improvement projects with confidence? Join This Old House Insider, a new streaming service from This Old House, the iconic Emmy-winning series that inspired a generation of home enthusiasts. Stream over 1,000 episodes of This Old House and Ask This Old House commercial-free. 
Watch it all in the This Old House app. And join live online Q&As with our experts. Best of all, you can try Insider free for seven days. To join, go to thisoldhousemembership.com. Richard, nice to see you. What a beautiful old house. Thank you. How old is it? The middle part was made in the 1860s. Before we got here, some family added on over there. In the last few years, we put this addition on. Well, this is what you see with these old houses. The original house exists. It gets handed down to the next generation. They put a wing on. You guys put a wing on. It gets pretty big after a while. Yeah, yeah, and we love it here. What I emailed you about was a toilet upstairs. Toilets, my calling card. Let's go. Richard, the bathroom's right over here. All right. This is a great old house indeed. Look at these wide plank pine floors. Beautiful. Yep, and they go all the way into the bathroom. Nice. So I guess you can see what my problem well, that's is. That's not original. No. It's a screwdriver. It's, no, it's not. What's going on? Over the last few weeks, the toilet's got a little wobbly, so I did a little short-term fix to help it out. Did that fix it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime I think about a toilet wobble, I think about the attachment method, the two bolts, and the wax seal underneath it. Yeah, I had thought it was the wax seal too, so I took it off and replaced it, and it's actually gotten worse. Gotten worse. Okay. I think it's time to dive in. All right, there's a cold water shut off right here that I'm going to turn off. Okay, that's off. And now I'm going to flush to get some of the water out. Jack, why don't you run down to the truck? And I, at the back, I've got a bucket of tools. Sure. We'll get the rest of the water out. Okay, so we've got all the water out of the bowl and the tank. But before I pull it, I just want to show you one thing right here. You see this level? I mean, I mean, you can tell by your eye, but look how far it's off. Yeah. So this whole floor is settled. Now, a toilet can operate not being exactly level. It just doesn't look right. It's completely wrong. And being crooked is not what causes this wobble problem. All right, so now I'm going to pull the toilet. I've broken the water connections, and there's two bolts, two closet bolts that are connected to the flange. I'm going to loosen them here. I'm not going to loosen. Look at this. The knot is completely driven down so far that the washer is completely mangled down inside. So there's really no purchase on the top of this china. So if I wiggle it, see the bolt goes up and down inside. So I think that's our culprit. But we've gone this far. Let's pull everything to be sure everything's good underneath. Okay, there's the right side. Let's get the left. Okay, both nuts are off. Just move that bucket. I'm going to put the toilet right there. Straight up. All right, so there's the wax seal. It doesn't look too bad, but I've got to take it out of there so we can do a little inspection on the flange below. The closet flange is the most important part of this connection. All right, so with the wax seal gone, you can see our closet flange. It actually looks pretty good. It's a metal ring. A lot of times we find them broken. This isn't. And it's properly secured to the floor. You see all weather screws right here, right here, right here, right here. So the issue is not that we're not secured to the floor. That's perfect. The fact is that the floor has gone south on us. Look at how far it's gone. You know, just, just like we saw up on top, you know, it's completely, it's like a half an inch there at one point. So I'm not going to be able to bring this floor up, but what I want to do before I leave is to provide shims underneath this toilet that make the toilet sit flush and fill this gap all the way around, okay? All right, it's time to rebuild. Now you need a set of these closet bolts. It comes with a nice little lock washer that's really handy. And what you do is you push it almost all the way down, and now you see there's a keyway right here, and it goes in and slides to the center point. And that lock washer holds it so it doesn't fall down through the floor and keeps it upright. Now here's another one. Okay. Okay, so there is our two bolts. Now for the wax ring, I'm going to use something a little different, this foam gasket. It's a little more forgiving. You know, when you put a wax ring on, if it deforms or you tip on it, the wax doesn't bounce back. This thing does. So it goes here. It has a little horn. Okay, we're ready for the toilet. Okay, just guide me onto the bolts there. Okay, a little further. Very good. All right, so look at this thing rock. This is how far this floor is out. So I can't even start thinking about tightening up these bolts until I shim. 
Now they make these cool shims, you know, just like a, the shape of a shingle, but they're plastic and they have ribs. So now if I put them together in opposing directions, the ribs will lock in so I can have any different height I need. I'm, I don't know, I'm probably gonna need two or three of them in the back here. I don't think I've ever seen a floor this far up. Another shim. There you go. Just grab that level and pop it on the top there. Not bad at all. That well, looks much better. All right, so now it's time to re-secure. So it's going to start with the one thing that you actually didn't have before, and that's this white base cap right here for the toilet cap. And you think it's just cosmetic, but it isn't. What it does is it takes the washer, and the, the force that that washer is going to exert pushing down transfers to this plastic and makes a nice surface to go against the china. You didn't have it before, and that's why the nut deformed that washer. Next is a half-inch nut. And now we're going to tighten that down. And what we're going to do is actually do both sides, keep on snugging it up, snug it up. And as we drive this thing down against the shims, we'll also compress that gasket and make a tight seal. Okay. You don't want to over tighten either side too much either. So you can see these closet bolts run long, so it doesn't allow you to put the caps on. So you have to cut it with a little hacksaw, mini hacksaw blade. It's a soft brass, so it generally cuts pretty easy. You can hear it when it's getting close. Okay, I'm clearing that out. Perfect. All right, so water is back on, and you're back in business. What do you think, my friend? Looks great, Richard. Secure. Doesn't move. And that toilet's not going anywhere. We've got a really solid connection. The flange is in fine shape. We've got a good seal. The bolts are fine. We've got shims all the way around. And really, the only thing I don't like about this is that the shims are exposed there. So some people might put caulking or putty just to cover it up. But that's just a cosmetic issue. It's okay. not, it's not going to leak. All right? You're in business. All right, thank you very much, Richard. It all looks right, great. Friend. You can put this back wherever it came from. Thank you very <laughs> much. You see him, uh, yeah, that's nice of you. Just stick it to him with a <laughs> screwdriver. He huh? was a good sport. No, he seemed like he was. And he tried. You know, but the common error is not having all the parts and pieces you need. Anytime you reconnect into a flange, you need to have the bolt and all this hardware. There's six pieces. And what he was missing was these two pieces, the base and the toilet bolt cap. And because of it, look at how much it bent. This is the actual unit. It bent right down inside the hole of the toilet. And you can imagine a couple hundred pounds moving back and forth, it would bend that That's easily. Right. Yeah, because it's just soft brass even though it's, it's chrome plated. Right. And there's a right and a wrong way on these bolt caps. Most people see these and say, oh, look at the little ridge right here. Maybe it goes this way because the cap would fit on top of it. And it's not. You can see it says this side up and it has a little ability to now clip in when you push down on it. Easy to miss that. You know, I was not happy with the gap that you weren't happy with either. Right. And I'm thinking to myself, that just can't stand. Right. Well, there were other repairs we could have done. It was a much bigger job. One is to open up, to take the toilet off, open the floor, sister the joist, raise it, put the floors back down. A thousand bucks right there. Right. Easy. Or to cut a base material underneath the toilet. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That was made out of PVC or some man-made substrate and then try to, but you'd have to cut it and cant it and stuff like that. Neither one were easy. This would at least give them a functional toilet right. that won't leak. Right. Good. All right. Well, good information. And uh, you got a miss screwdriver back. <laughs> nice of you. We're headed to the foothills of the Catskill Mountains in upstate New York to meet Jimmy Duresta. Jimmy is a maker who shares how-to videos online. And we're visiting his workshop to make a project that's part metal, part wood, and very unique. Jimmy. What's up, buddy? Good to see you again. How are you? How you doing? All right. Been a long time, huh? A long time. So about we worked together, yeah, about eight years ago. Yeah, yeah. And then I've been following you religiously thank on you. social media, which is awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank God for social media. <laughs> and you got yourself a new place. I got room. <laughs> Finally in my life. You go from New York City to upstate New York, yeah, yeah. and you got room to do everything. I got. I can keep projects going. It's great. I have. I can see the sun. It's amazing. <laughs> You're filming too? Yep. 
making videos and everything gets filmed. Every project we do gets filmed. Yeah, well, we're going to make a little video too for TV, but we're going to work on this thing. And this is the right prototype right. of what you're thinking? Yeah, this is the prototype. I made this a few years ago. This is Tennessee birch sliced about two inches thick yeah. and then pieced together in a sort of a geometric pattern. And I used the, the sawdust from the cutoffs mixed with resin as the infill. Very cool. So you get sort of a slab that looks like wood. It's got all yep. the character right there. And it cuts. And then you got it framed here in a nice little sleek metal table. Yep, this is coal rolled steel. I made a tray to pop it in. So we're going to do uh, the same design here? We're going to make it smaller. I learned a couple of problems on this size, so we're going to bring the scale down for on the wood a little bit. We're going to start with a steel frame, half as big, and the slices are going to be thinner and smaller because I got smaller trees. All right. So we're going to start with the wood or we're going to start with the metal? We're going to start with the metal frame. Here we go. This is going to become our table. We got three quarter inch bar stock for the legs. Yeah. We have 17 inches tall. Okay. And this is going to become the frame that goes around the top. So we got just regular old angle iron. One inch angle iron. Yeah. You can pretty much get it anywhere. Okay. And I notch these corners. I don't typically like to do 45 degree corners when I weld, because when you have two very sharp points right here at the end. Right. When you go to weld, they kind of melt backwards. So you just end up with this notch creates what a butt joint right there? Basically kind of like a lap butt joint combination. Right. I, don't, I mean wood it would have a specific name. Here it's just a, the joint that works. So when this comes together this is our tray. This is our tray. Beautiful. All right we're ready to weld? Yep. All right, I want to hit all the joints I just welded with the grinder. That'll give us a smooth connection for the legs. And then we can weld the legs onto the frame. All right, this is our scrap piece of MDF, which is going to create the bottom of our tray. Yeah. And because of the weld bead, I can't get into that corner to grind, and no one's ever going to see it. I ground out material oh, on the MDF. A lot easier to grind the MDF. Yep, that's it. So that's our tray. And now we have about a quarter of an inch. Wow, that's thin. We're just creating the illusion, so it's like a veneer. So we got the wood here. Mm -hmm. Just something you pulled off the property. I went out in the back in the 40 acres and cut these down. I got a bunch. I don't know what the species is. Yeah. And we're going to slice them on the bandsaw. Before we put epoxy in here, I need to seal up this whole trough with hot glue, and that's just so it doesn't leak out. All right, we're going to use this two-part epoxy. We're going to pour a little puddle in here, and we're going to place our pieces into that puddle. They're going to be secured in there once it dries. Beautiful. I could probably try and create a secret message with the skinny ones. Rorschach test. Did you ever do anything like this with glass? Tiles or anything. This is basically. Well, you know, so I don't, mosaic. I don't weld, right? You could easily do the same project without welding. Right. You just make a little trough table. Right. So it's like a jigsaw puzzle. See who gets the last piece. That's it. We let this cure for about two hours, and then we'll belt sand it smooth.
Okay, a little bit of time with the belt sander, a little more with the palm sander, smooth, flat. I love it. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to give it a high gloss. We got this epoxy resin, it's going to pour right on top. Mm -hmm. We got to mix equal part A and B. I'll show you a trick on how to mix it in the cup. Okay. We take a stick and we just give ourselves two even dots on the stick, right? Look at you. So now we pour up to the one line and then we pour up to the second line. Very clever. And that's our mixing stick. Now we mix it. We got to mix it thoroughly, otherwise we're going to have a problem. So we're going to brush it on. See that wood tone popping? Yeah. It's partly filling the voids. Yeah, it's certainly. It's definitely going to fill in it. Gives it like a appearance of these little pieces of wood floating in there. Yeah, actually, some of that wood did float. Yeah. So that's why it was a little harder to sand them down. Oops. They floated in that epoxy we had, that little puddle we put in there. And you'll see some bubbles forming. We don't have to worry about them because this has such a long cure time. It's intended for the bubbles to pop out, but we will coax the bubbles out a little bit with the heat gun. So this is, uh, oh yeah, that's nice and dry. Yeah, isn't that pretty? That is great. So I love that. The geometric patterns, those rings all throughout. That's yep. awesome. So this is done? It's done. We're going to prep the steel now. There's a little bit of surface on here. We're going to smooth that out. OK, now we're going to prep the surface with acetone. We want to get all any hand oils or any of the oils from working off of the surface. When these sit in the mill yard, the steel mill yard, they are covered with oil. Yeah. You got to pick them up with gloves. This is a chemical blackener. As opposed to paint, which is, covers up the texture of the steel, it creates a chemical reaction which oxidizes to the color black, or like deep blues, deep blacks. The final step is a spray on lacquer. Yep, that lacquer, that's a nice look. Isn't so, that nice? Yeah, I like that. Uh, in terms of materials, what are we talking? I mean, the steel? Steel's 25 bucks, but if you know a local machinist, you could probably get this stuff for free. Mm. This is cutoffs all day long in a shop like mine. Well, and then the branches are free cutoffs too, obviously. Yeah. In terms of the epoxy, what's that? 25 bucks, and you probably could use the same epoxy we bought for the top as for the bottom. So we're what easily under $75. Definitely. Love it. Next time on Ask This Old House. This wall probably looked great when it went in a few years ago. Right now, not too good. I'm going to show you what went wrong and how to fix it. This looks really, really good. All right, so what I want to get installed for you today is a thing called an on-demand water heater, also called an instantaneous water heater. And I'll show you a few tricks on how to get more out of a basic circular saw. Thanks for watching. This old house has got a video for just about every home improvement project, so be sure to check out the others. And if you like what you see, click on the subscribe button. Make sure that you get our newest videos right in your feed.